War in the Middle East. Israeli forces drive spearheads across the Sinai Peninsula, west to the Suez Canal, south to the entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba, breaking the blockade, capturing the west bank of the Jordan River, and occupying the old city of Jerusalem. This is the end of history. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. We believe that peace is at hand. An axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world. So in our last episode, we looked at the year 1948, the the state, the pivotal turns of the Middle East in that post-World War II year that obviously included the establishment of the state of Israel. Now, this was a big one in the shaping of the Middle East, because now, after two world wars, in the eyes of the people and the leaders of the Middle East, the global order continued to pound home this reality. Far from being dead and buried, imperialism was alive and well in the Middle East. Maybe it was through the the oil industry. Maybe it was through the occupying forces. Maybe it was through interference in the regimes and the governments like Iraq and Lebanon or many other places, but it's there. And that didn't really match the, the promises of the great powers in the Western world. Now, this is a really important theme to the shaping of the modern Middle East from the beginning, way back at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, all the way to today in the present, the sense that the region was never allowed to develop, to to shape itself on its own. It's almost palpable. The driving reality that interference from the great powers has maintained a state of disorder and dysfunction in the Middle East is not only a historic reality, but it's a cultural grievance that people of this region have held against the world for generations. When we looked at 1948 in that last episode, I warned We shouldn't look at the history of the modern Middle East through the lens of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict alone. That's not the real story of the Middle East, even if a lot of people still see it that way. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict fits into the historic uh, reality, fits into the history of the Middle East, in, in that it was, in the view of the people in this region of the world, exhibit A evidence that the great powers of the West would do whatever they wanted to in this region. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's a flashpoint issue, kind of a flashpoint issue. Each nation of the Middle East, each people group, each religious or ethnic group has their own history, their own story, but they all manage to bond around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's the evidence they need for why the world doesn't treat them fairly. Now, some of this is very justified. Some of it is also overblown. But this is the reality of perceptions in the Middle East. And perceptions, you know, tend to shape reality. And that's the way the historic reality has been shaped. So from 1948 on in our story, the story of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict does play a leading part in the history of the Middle East. It's not always logical. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has very little to do with nations like Saudi Arabia or Iran or even Iraq. But it became the trophy grievance for anything and everything that was wrong in the region from 1948 onward. Of course, the sad part is that the people on the ground caught in this conflict are often forgotten. They're used simply as pawns in this games of of tit for tat and grievance. The Palestinians have been without a homeland for nearly 80 years, and that's a horrible injustice, but it's also one that both Israel and the Arab nations share responsibility for. The formation of the state of Israel was very clearly an imposed, an artificial solution for sins committed by the Western world that the Middle East was seen as an easy solution for. It's also a handy scapegoat for everything that ailed the Middle East states from 1948 onward. Underneath all of the posturing, all the injustice, is the overlooked lives of both Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs. Those are the ones caught in the middle. Near the end of the Second Intifada, we'll get to explaining what that means in a later episode, but I spent some time in the West Bank. This was, I think, around 2003. I think that's when it was. But I I met a a lot of Palestinian Christians and church leaders there at that time. Now, most of us in the West don't think of Palestinians as Christians. 
That doesn't fit our profile of them. We think of Hamas. We think of Muslims. The reality is that at the outbreak of the October 7th, 2023 war in Israel and Gaza, there were only 45,000 Hamas members in Gaza. That's, and that's the largest number. Some people put that at number at 25,000. Compare that to 2.2 million Palestinians living in the Gaza area alone. Hamas is not a real representative of, of Palestine. It's like saying the mafia is representative of New Jersey. It's there, yeah, but there's a lot more going on behind the flashy headlines. Anyway, so I'm visiting with these Palestinian Christians, I guess it was closer to 2005, and I met different generations of people who lived there in the West Bank. Now, these were people who experienced the Al-Nakba, or catastrophe, of 1948. That's what they call, they call it. That's what the birth of Israel is known as among Palestinians. They, they saw their homes bulldozed by Israeli forces. The Palestinian historian Rashid Khalidi, he says that more than 400 Palestinian towns and villages were depopulated during the Al-Nakba. Thousands of buildings were destroyed. When it comes to the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we miss the real human experience when we see it in simply geopolitical terms alone. Imagine being a child and seeing your home bulldozed by a military force that you understand as an occupying or even an imperial force. Now, it would be really easy to hold hatred toward that group. And for most Palestinians, that's exactly what they did. These particular Palestinians that I was meeting, the ones in 2005, they had learned to forgive. That was the miracle of, of grace and their faith in Christ. They didn't get any rewards for their action. They were still discriminated, I'm sorry, discriminated. <laughs> discriminated against in Israel, still face bombings and attacks in future generations all the way to the present, still face discrimination from the West, especially among Christians, Christian Zionists, but they're living on higher ground in a spiritual sense. Of course, that's not the story of most Palestinians. Most Palestinians did feel highly victimized and high levels of anger and hatred towards Israel after 1948. It would get worse after this. The Palestinians, many of them, were now refugees. The UN set up official refugee status for the Palestinians. Like we talked about in the last episode, Jordan ruled over the West Bank. Egypt ruled over Gaza. Israel, of course, extended its holdings far beyond the partition, deep into the territory that the UN had reserved for the Palestinians under the partition plan in 1948. And they did that based upon the justification that the aggression of the Arab nations that invaded Israel meant they had ab abandoned the partition plan. Egypt sponsored a Palestinian nationalist organization called Fatah. Fatah was, the le was led by Yasser Arafat. Those around my age will probably recognize that name, know his face. I don't know if younger people will, but this is a significant name in the history of the Palestinians. The Fatah operated, or Fatah operated as a Palestinian state in exile. As and Arafat assumed the role of leadership and vo the voice for the Palestinian people. That all started in the 1950s, but they really, the Egyptians, they really did, and the and Fatah, they really did little more than frequent guerrilla incursions into Israel. The period between 1948 and 1967, among the Palestinians, those were seen as the lost years. The active voice of real Palestinian leadership was lost. The Palestinians, again, were just pawns in the game between the Arabs and the Isra Israelis during these decades. Arab leaders thought the region of the Middle East used the plight for the, of the Palestinians. They used that for their advantage. They explained that the West was against them. Israel was proof of that for the Arab world. Nearly every Arab country and leader did this after 1948. But the most effective for this, the most effective for sure in doing this, was Gamal Abdul Nasser out of Egypt. Now, Nasser, he was born just before the end of actually the First World War. So during the interwar period, he became an avid Egyptian nationalist. I mentioned already in uh, earlier episodes how the, the two places where nationalism was most developed by the end of the First World War was in Egypt and the lands we know as Syria today. Well, the problem with developed nationalism in Egypt was that this was the location of the Su Suez Canal. All right, so the Suez was vital to British, to Western interests. It allowed for a shortcut for both global trade and military transportation that prevented the West from having to travel all the way around the horn of the continent of Africa. So the British planned to never let go of this important passageway, and so they, they were never going to let go of Egypt. That was the end result of that. Well, the king of Egypt, King Farouk, was a bit of a dandy. 
He was considered a playboy by most, most accounts. He was interested in self-determination for the nation, but only in so much as it played into his personal in- interest and his personal prosperity. True Egyptian nationalists saw him as little more than a puppet, a puppet for the British imperialist who held the real power by World War II. In fact, in 1943, at the height of World War II, when King Farouk refused to dismiss Egypt's prime minister, British troops and tanks surrounded the palace of the Egyptian king. Britain's ambassador marched into the palace, demanded the king replace the prime minister with someone more sympathetic to British interests in the country of Egypt. Well, the king acquiesced, and Egyptian nationalists were infuriated. Included among such nationalists was a young military officer by the name of Gamal Abdel Nasser. Now, adding insult to injury, in 1948, Nasser fought in the Arab-Israeli War. Nasser, unlike a lot of his contemporaries in the Middle East after that war, he didn't blame Western imperialism alone for the Arab failures in that fight. He famously chided the lack of preparedness of Egypt's and other Arab nations' militaries during the 1948 war. He saw firsthand the incompetence of the so-called Arab war machine. So as things stood in 1948, they didn't have a chance against Israel's better trained, better led, and better equipped military. Well, after the war, Nasser, he joined a secret group of officers within the Egyptian military who actively conspired for Egyptian independence and opposition to the British in their country. This group became known in history as the Free Officers Movement. He was actually a lower ranking member of this secret organization, but in 1952, they actually enacted a coup that overthrew the Egyptian monarchy. And Nasser, not the leader, but over the next year, he quickly rose in prominence in public opinion among the Egyptians, and then finally in title. So by 1956, Nasser was the president and uncontested leader of the Egyptian nation. For the next decade, Gamal Abdel Nasser would be the leading figure of the Arab Middle East. He's a really fascinating figure in the history of the 20th century, and of course, in the Middle East. But today, when we think of the Middle East, people in the West often think of like Islamic extremism, things like that. But in, in fact, all of that came quite a bit later in the history of the Middle East. Nasser, probably more than anyone else, set the course for this alternate pathway for the Middle East in the post-World War II era. One of the few truly Islamic political organizations at that time was the Muslim Brotherhood. They were based in Egypt, and they actually attempted to assassinate Nasser early in his rise to power. And on account of that, he was set pretty much against them, pretty staunchly against them from that point on. In fact, Nasser oppressed a lot of the Islamic groups while he he managed his peak of power, his peak of influence throughout the Middle East. Similar to guys like Ataturk in Turkey, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, he wanted to modernize Egypt. He wanted to bring it into the 20th century. He wasn't looking backward to the glory of the past golden ages of the Arab world or the, the Islamic world. He was looking forward. He was looking to future glory. So key to that future glory as he saw it was a politicized Middle East. The Middle East was at a disadvantage because the region didn't develop along the, the political lines of East and West into the modern era. They had to change. So key to that change was this idea of Nasser's of Pan-Arabism. Now, Pan-Arabism meant that the nations of the Middle East would take on a joint Arab identity and they would unite in their struggles against the West and the rest of the world. This was a model that a lot of different regions were trying out in the post-war era. We saw Pan-Africanism, Pan, Pan-Americanism, like in, it was a, all about a united front of our, uh, for united interest at that time. But more than all the rest, Pan-Arabism had a figurehead in the person of Nasser. He was seen as a formidable challenger to the Western world. For a while, Nasser made the radical move of merging Egyptian and Syrian nationalist identities by creating what was known as the United Arab Republic, or the UAR. When I was a kid, you could even find, in fact, in my my fifth grade textbook, I remember maps of the Middle East that included the UAR in it. Now, that could have been just because I attended a a poor school that didn't, didn't have new textbooks, but the UAR was a federation between Syria and Egypt, and it was intended to be the first step in the formation of a larger united Arab identity among the Middle Eastern states. Nasser was the president of the UAR, but it never really took off as planned. The the Syrians saw the Egyptians, including Nasser, as condescending in their leadership of the group, 
Other nations decided they weren't too interested in submitting their own independence to Nasser's influence, no matter how charismatic he might be. Nevertheless, this experiment in nationalism and pan-Arab nationalism showed the scope of Nasser's ambitions. In 1956, he nationalized the Suez Canal, effectively taking Egyptian property back from the British. Well, that triggered what was known as the Suez Crisis, when France, Britain, and Israel conspired to regain the Suez. Now, the idea was Israel was going to launch this semi-fake attack on Egypt. France and Britain would then intervene, intervene and, and move Egypt out of the Suez Canal. The entire effort really backfired, primarily because America, the new leading superpower of the West by this time, really saw through the scheme. They wouldn't back it. But more than just a failure on the part of the British to take back the canal, the Suez crisis exposed Israel, again, as a tool of Western imperialists, which the Arab states already assumed to be the case, and it highlighted Nasser as a major threat to these imperialist nations. In an alternate timeline of history, and I like to think about situations like this, but Nasser could have been a major ally for the U.S. in the Middle East. If the if the U.S. policymakers hadn't bungled the relationship, that might have been what happened. And history certainly could have turned out a lot differently from that point on. The U.S., for its part, was seeing everything going on in the world by this time within the framework of the Cold War. So the new generation of riding, rising leaders in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, they're either communist or they're pro-American. They didn't have any middle ground, right? The American policymakers couldn't quite conceive that perhaps— these new leaders, like Nasser, were interested in their own country and not the struggles of the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. In an effort to modernize Egypt's economy, Nasser wanted to build the Aswan Dam on the Nile River. The U.S. actually extended financial aid to bring that about, but then, I guess, apparently in a deliberate effort to embarrass Nasser, the U.S. took this, this aid back, leaving Nasser frustrated and easily, obviously, turning to the Soviets for assistance at that point. Now, Nasser wasn't a communist. He, he actually opposed the local communists in Egypt on several occasions. He was an Egyptian. He was an, an Arab nationalist. In fact, after the confusion in Egypt's relations with the U.S., Nasser and a small group of other influential leaders in the newly independent nations of the world by this time, they helped head, a gro head a, another group called the Non-Aligned Movement of the United Nations. So the Non-Aligned Movement included leaders like Nehru of India, Nkwame Nkrumah of Ghana, and Suharto of Indonesia. The idea was these guys, these, these nations were neither pro-Soviet or pro-American. They were pro their own countries, and, and they were going to work to play the great powers against one another for their own interest. Now, all these guys, really influential, but again, Nasser was probably the most influential of all, at least in the first decade or so of his power in Egypt. Now, while Egypt enjoyed the rise and the influence of Nasser on the global stage in this post-1948 era, situations elsewhere in the Middle East weren't quite as good. Mimicking Nasser's pan-Arabism and the UAR alliance between Syria and Egypt, King Hussein, the king of Jordan, he proposed a union between his country and Iraq. Jordan and Iraq, after all, were both established as monarchies of the Hashemites, the sons of Hussein. Remember, we had Faisal and Abdullah after World War I. We remember that from a prior episode. Well, even if the nations themselves were completely made-up entities, the leaders, at least, held a common bond between, between their, their family and through, you know, through blood. But this union was even less successful than the one between Syria and Egypt. Inspired yet again by moves from Nasser, in 1958, military officers in Iraq conspired. They conspired in an officer's coup that overthrew the monarchy in that country. So the, the Hashemite dynasty officially came to an end that year in Iraq. The remaining family members were actually executed in the palace courtyard. The crown prince's corpse was dismembered, dragged through the streets. And so ended the fateful reign of the Hussein family, the Hashemite family in Iraq. Saddam Hussein, it's not, he's not the Hashemite family, different Hussein. King Faisal, the friend of Lawrence of Arabia and the, the favored champion of British causes in Iraq, it's kind of strange, kind of sad, I guess, to think about it. He didn't even manage to get four generations of successful leadership among his family members on the Iraqi throne by this point. So if it was any consol uh, consolation, the, the coup leaders themselves, they faced 
Inglorious Ends as well. This was the story of Iraq, the, the pattern of one coup after another. It wouldn't be halted, in fact, until the rise of Saddam Hussein in 1979. The military and the officers of the 1958 coup in Iraq, they kind of demonstrated the dysfunction within the nation itself. One represented the Shia Muslims, one the Sunni Muslims, and one the Kurds. And the idea was for the three of them to merge these diverse constituencies of Iraq into a united government. Well, Qasim, the, the one who represented the Sunni Muslims, he became the prime minister and soon overturned the goals of the so-called revolution and, of course, became an autocrat. Not long after Qasim's rise to power, the British granted Kuwait its independence and Iraq wanted to move in and take control. Now, the reason I mentioned this part is because that probably sounds familiar. <laughs> it happened again in the 1990s, and that led the U.S. to war there at that time. And it's weird that Iraq and its dictators, which, ha again, this country has no basis, no historical basis as a real nation before 1919, but they've been adamant that Kuwait should have belonged within their borders. Well, Qasim was not as successful in Iraq, but this action against Kuwait helped turn the U.S., against him. In 1963, the American CIA actually helped the Iraqi and Syrian political group, the, the Ba'ath, uh, overthrow. They, they helped them overthrow the Qasim. Now, a lot of that history with the CIA and the Ba'ath, it's remained classified. But it's interesting to note that it's the Ba'ath party that would eventually channel the rise of Saddam Hussein in the 1970s. And this is who the American CIA sided with at that time. Not directly with Hussein, but with the Ba'ath Party. Qasim was given a show, show trial after the coup. He was shot, then followed a purge where around 1,500 of his supporters, his loyalists, were also kill, killed. This was the state of Iraq in the post-war era, a quivering, fragile mess of instability. Multiple coups, multiple struggles for power continued throughout the 1960s. In the background of all these coups in Iraq, and often acting as a principal factor of instability, was the first Iraqi-Kurdish war that lasted from 1961 to 1970. The Kurds were one of the people groups in the Middle East that really got the shaft after World War I. As much as anyone else in the region, they anticipated their own nation and, and, and homeland. And they, they expected to get it. Well, instead, their hopes were folded into this toxic concoction known as Iraq. The Sunni and Shia Muslims of Iraq were also split. But if they found one thing to agree upon, it was their opposition to the Kurds. So throughout the decade of the 1960s, Iraqi Arabs battled against the Kurds of Iraq. By the time it was all said and done, in the decade of the 1960s, the first Iraqi-Kurdish war claimed more than 100,000 casualties. Neither side achieved much of anything and what they went after. The, the Kurds had no homeland. The, the Arabs had not expelled or eliminated the Kurds, but it did plenty to damage the Iraqi state. More coups, more seizures for power, only further destabilized this nation. And of course, this was the design all along, remember? Iraq was designed to fail, all, to always need British support for its stability. The problem, of course, was that the British, and we've talked about this in the last couple of episodes, the British weren't there anymore. The U.S. was the new superpower of the West, but by this point, the U.S. hadn't quite made up its mind how to involve itself, how deeply to involve itself within the Middle East. So to that end, a lot of the policy decisions by the U.S. within the Middle East during the 1950s, during the 60s, it was kind of a one step forward, two steps back kind of dance. Now, the one place that the U.S. was confident it wanted to involve itself, however, was in Iran. Now, the vast oil fields of Iran set too near the, the threat of the Soviets in the North. And the only thing worse than the U.S. and the Western world losing access to these rich oil fields of the Persian Gulf would be for the Soviet Union getting hold of them. So to that end, the U.S. as the last major superpower of the West after World War II took a disproportional level of interest in Iran. All the way to, to 1979, Iran represented key pillars of U.S. interest in the Middle East. We're going to talk about the second pillar of U.S. interest in policy in the Middle East near the end of this episode. But the biggest example of this U.S. and Iranian special, re special relationship in the Middle East, of course, was the coup of 1953. Now, we discussed this in the last episode in this series, but the breakdown of Iranian oil profits with the likes of Great Britain and eventually the U.S., 
that was a sort source of consistent resist, res, uh, resentment among the Iranian people. This issue provided easy leverage for any politician who wanted to gain popularity among the people. Well, in the early 1950s, Mohammad Mossadegh rose to prominence in Iran. He became the democratically elected prime minister. Remember, I said democratically elected prime minister in Iran. And the most popular issue that, issue that facilitated his rise was the oil concessions. It was Iranian oil and the profits should belong to the Iranian people. Definitely not veering away from any common sense on that point. So as Mossadegh went to nationalize the Iranian oil fields, the U.S. and Great Britain saw a threat similar to what Nasser had done to, with the Suez or would do with the Suez in 56. He was making a move against Western interest. And so it had to be in the, the, for the benefit of Russian interests. They couldn't see things outside of this bipolar worldview of the Cold War. Well, that didn't make any sense, of course. The binary view of the world was the, the cause of a lot of problems with the U.S. policy during the Cold War. Cold War. Mossadegh was interested in Iranian interest, not the Soviet interest. But the U.S. and Great Britain, of course, couldn't see it any other way. So the U.S. and the British conspired to topple Mossadegh. They, they wanted to topple him from power, firm, and they firmly established Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the, the Shah, as the dictator of Iran. He's going to hold power until 1979. And the Shah, this U.S. ally, he became notorious for his oppression among the Irani, Iranians. For many in the Middle East, they recognized behind that oppression sat the U.S. and the CIA, who illegitimately propped up this guy's power. So we, we kind of have this picture of the Middle East developing by 1967. In some countries, we see strongmen who would rule. That's like Nasser in Egypt. In Iran, it was the Shah, even though his strength was founded on American support. Then at the other end of the spectrum, we have this massive instability in places like Iraq, where which was experiencing coups and fragile governments. But again, the reason for this wasn't simply because the people of the people within this nation. This was by design. The great powers of 1919 and then 1948 had helped craft, had helped shape these nations to be weak and unstable by default. It was almost as if the colonial powers like Britain and France never bothered to consider what would happen if they weren't there to support, to stabilize these countries. In Syria, the situation was just as unstable, if not more so, as it was in Iraq. The French evacuated the country in 46, and by 49, 1949, the country had its first coup. Syria, in fact, set the stage for the first coup of the Arab world. Of course, it wouldn't be the last, not in the Middle East, not in Syria, not by a good sight. But before 1949 was even over, Syria had another coup. Then again in 54, and again in 61. In 1961, the Ba'athists came to power. Remember, these are the guys in Iraq again. They had, they'd consolidated a lot of their political power and rose up in Syria. Even with the hardline and ruthless Ba'ath leaders in place, things didn't improve. The Ba'athists held on to power, but different members of the political party overthrew one after another. Now, if you're getting the impression that it was just a pretty terrible situation throughout the region, you're pretty much right. The one strange exception to this rule was Lebanon. After the French departed at the end of World War II, they left behind an independent Lebanon. And one would think that this little country would have gone the same way as Syria and Iraq. And that would happen eventually. But for the most part, Lebanon, between World War II, between 1967, was a bright spot in the Middle East. It was known, actually, as the Paris of the Middle East. Beirut, the capital city of Lebanon, didn't gain that reputation merely because of the country's connection with France. Extravagant spending by the Saudis and other petrol states in the 50s and 60s. They had all this oil money coming in. They were spending it there in Beirut, and they boosted the Lebanese economy and created this place of posh comfort for the whole region to enjoy. Those who, you know, were willing to do that under the cover of the more conservative religious elements or outside the view of the more religious or conservative religious elements. Things were about to change in Lebanon, though. In fact, things were about to change for the whole of the Middle East. And the explosion of those changes occurred in the formidable year of 1967. And that's the year we're looking at in this episode. And of course, it all starts in Israel. So many listeners probably know about the Six-Day War in 1967. But most don't realize how impacting this was far beyond the borders of Israel and into the wider Middle East. It was 1967. 
67, the, the Six Days War that solidified U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and made Israel its second geopolitical pillar there in that region. Before 1967, Iran was the special friend of the U.S. in the region. After 67, it was Iran and Israel. And it's worth noting, too, that Iran and Israel were also super friendly during these years as well. Today, the U.S. is such a staunch, I would say even irrational ally to, to Israel at this point. And Iran is such a bitter enemy of the U.S. and the Middle East that anyone born after 1975, they probably fail to realize how different the reality was before 1967. The U.S. supported the formation of the state of Israel in 1948, but there, there was no sense of unconditional support at that time. In the 1950s, during the, the Eisenhower administration, the U.S. actually sided several times against Israel. Now, that's like the unpardonable sin now in U.S. politics. But at that time, it, it happened. For example, during the Suez crisis, when Israel, France, and Britain, and I've already talked about this, but when they conspired in this fake cause for war between Israel and Egypt, which they hoped would ultimately lead to Europe regaining control of the Suez Canal, it was the U.S. who put the kibosh on the whole affair. It was embar embarrassing for Britain and France, and as far as the Arab world was concerned, somewhat informing about Israel and the U.S., right? For a while, the Middle East leaders believed the U.S. might even be a more balanced player in the region than the great powers of Europe had been. If you'll recall, some of the mandate states during the interwar period, they actually requested oversight from the U.S. rather than Europe because they believed the U.S. was more genuinely interested and independence than Europe was. Well, the problem, of course, was that the U.S. may have been more interested in independence, but they weren't interested in the Middle East at that time. In 1954, Israel carried out attacks against some American targets in Egypt. This was known as Operation Susanna, Susanna or the Levan Affair. And the Israel, Israelis tried to make it look like Egyptians hit American and British targets in Egypt, there in that country. The objective was to turn British and American sentiment against the, the Egyptians, and this thus pushed them further towards Israel, pushed the British and Americans towards further supporting Israel. Well, the plot failed, the charade was discovered, and Israel's defense minister actually had to resign due to the embarrassing scandal of everything that followed. Prior to 1967, the U.S. supported Israel for sure, especially during the administrations of JFK and Lyndon Johnson. But it wasn't until after 67 that U.S. support for Israel became a rubber stamp in places like the United Nations and elsewhere. This was, this was also where the perspective, after 1967, where the perspective of the Arab world began to drastically shift when it came to the U.S. After 67, the Arab world increasingly began to see the U.S. as another imperial power, backing Israel, backing Western influence in the world of the Middle East at their expense of the people of the Middle East. That was their perspective. Now, we've got to wade through some myths when it comes to the Six Days War. Growing up, this is me, when I was growing up in the Bible Belt, where Christian Zionism is understood as a fact of both life and of the Bible, the history of the Six Days War was retold like something out of a Tim LaHaye book. The Arab world surrounded Israel, tiny Israel, and, and in a miraculous shift of power, the Israelites conquered all of the Arab armies in just six days, pushing the Arabs out of Israel and parts of Palestine and even retaking large chunks, large segments of Palestine, gaining territory. This line of thinking, this mythology, is shared in, in a lot of documentaries about the Six Days War. I watched one documentary where the taking of Jerusalem from Jordan in 1967, during this war, when Israel took Jerusalem, it was described as some sort of ecstatic religious experience. And that, was, that wasn't even a Christian or a religious documentary. That was just the way it was expressed. And that was a reality for some people on the ground. But the way these things are presented, there's a lot of mythology here. It's not that the Six Days War wasn't a dramatic event. It definitely was. But the facts of the historical drama, they don't need, they don't need myths piled on top of them. The fighting between Israel and its Arab neighbors had been ongoing since 48, increasingly so by 1967. The Israeli historian Benny Morris, he describes these years as the wars of attrition. 
each side escalating the violence with each other's striking toward the other, even while they didn't flat out declare war, right? For Israel, the greatest threat was Egypt and Nasser. Egypt had a better developed military their military than the, the other nations did, the other Arab nations did. David Ben-Gurion, one of the founding fathers and the first prime minister of the state of Israel, he was always concerned that Nasser would be like some kind of Ataturk type of figure. And his pan-Arabism and the influence he exercised over the, the Arab nations of the Middle East was a distinct and a definite threat to Israel. Second to that was Jordan, not so much because of their military power, but because of Jordan's proximity and ease of access for guerrillas in the post-1948 period. There was no surprise invasion or attack in 1967, not by the Arabs. The buildup toward the war was ongoing for weeks, even months. In Egypt, Nasser and his generals were in a sort of self-defeating race to ramp up the rhetoric against Israel. King Hussein in Jordan was actually trying to slow things down, ease the tensions to no avail. In Israel, the great concern was who was going to fire the first shot in this war that, was, that they knew was coming in 1967. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson, he promised U.S. support of Israel, but only if they weren't the ones who started the fighting. So that left Israel's prime minister, Levi Eshkol, in quite a predicament. The military, as, many, as well as many of the more, more hawkish members of the, the Israeli government, the Knesset, they were demanding Israel leverage its military advantage and start the war before Egypt could do so. And every day they delayed, Israel lost some of its advantage. That's what they were afraid of. In the ramp up to war, Israel's prime minister, Levi Eshkol, he made this televised address to the nation. And he had just had a cataract eye surgery. So during this televised address, he, and you know, sometimes nonfiction is better than fiction in stories like this, but he kept blinking. He kept losing focus while he was on camera. So his speech was a rushed up job at the end of it all. And it actually, you know, as he's blinking, doing these weird facial tics and he's rushing through the, the language of the speech and it was a rushed up production, it actually pushed the nation of Israel into a sort of panic. In Tel Aviv and major cities, Israelis began digging bomb shelters in the city parks. The leaders of the Israeli military, Yitzhak Rabin, he was a famous fighter from the 1948 war. He would eventually be a, a future prime minister of Israel. But in the buildup to the war, he actually had a nervous breakdown. And that breakdown, it, it wasn't caused by the stress of encroaching Arab neighbors. It was caused by the divided Israeli, Israeli's government on how to proceed. It wasn't his best moment, and he would come back before the fighting was done. But this opened the way for one of my favorite characters of Israel's modern military history, Moshe Dayan. This is an eye patch wearing warrior who would end up as the hero of the Six Days War. Far from a surprise victory of six days in, in the war, the Israeli military and its leaders actually anticipated victory in the war in as little as two days. All right. So the, the idea like, like this was such a shock victory in six days, that's not true. They expected it to, to secure a victory in two days. The key factor came down to air power in the estimation of the Israeli military. They felt that the priority was actually to strike first, something at odds with this mandate from Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson in Washington, D.C. So by June of 1967, the setting is set for this war. And you have to kind of track along to what the world was witnessing. Nasser and the Arabs were promising a massive Arab victory. They would push the Israelis into the sea, retake the land of Palestine. Really, they're saying, they're saying this stuff. This was kind of a new rule for the Arab nations and leaders at this point. They had to really ramp up, really amp up the rhetoric, even if at the same time, they were kind of hoping for a war not to actually start. And this was for sure what Nasser was hoping. He became weirdly indecisive during this time. After the war started, in fact, he disappeared for a couple of days, leaving Egypt, leaving its military kind of rudderless. But that was the state of affairs. June 5th, 1967, Israel decided, the Israeli government and military decided they had no choice, and strategically, they had to fire the first shot. And so began their operations that we would become famous. And they had been rehearsing these, these things for the past five years, all right, Israel had. Rather than dispatching their air force to fly from Israel across the Sinai to Egypt, their forces flew towards the Mediterranean Sea. Then, once far enough out, 
they circled back, coming at Egypt from the north. The pilots were told this would be a suicide mission if things went wrong. Really, things could have gone wrong. If the Egyptian military had been even half as prepared as they talked about, as they bragged about, then they should have easily adjusted for this attack from the north rather than from the east, but it didn't happen. On the summer morning, June 5th, the Israeli Air Force effectively wiped out Egypt's Air Force so that Egypt couldn't take to the skies. In a matter of minutes, Israel took out 286 of Egypt's 420 combat aircraft. Egypt's Air Force never even got off the ground. Even the Egyptian aircraft that was spared, they couldn't take flight for a long time because the runways were blocked by the burning de debris of other aircraft. June the 5th, 1967. Around 300 Israeli aircraft, mainly French-built fighter bombers, prepared to launch the most decisive airstrike in history. Their target, the air forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Now, right here, in that moment, with Israel taking control of the skies, this is when the war was won. And that fact wouldn't hit home for the next few days, but that was the reality. On the ground, Israeli tanks charged across the Sinai. Rather than meeting the long expected resistance from Egypt, the tank charge turned into a rout. Egyptian forces were in full retreat almost from the very beginning. Moshe Dayan, he had to give the Israeli forces explicit orders to not approach the Suez Canal because he was afraid of a repeat of world opinion turning against Israel like what had happened in 1957 during that Suez crisis. For Israel, everything had gone perfect in the fir those first few moments of the war. For Egypt, it had all gone exactly wrong. But, and this would be a pattern for the Arab states during these years, rather than taking the loss, Egypt piled on the, the errors and mistakes that spread into a barrage of unintended consequences. The, the Egyptians couldn't believe they were losing or that they had already lost the war. One officer later wrote that for five years, the Israeli army had rehearsed their battle plans while Egypt had rehearsed victory parades. Refusing to own up to the reality of defeat, the Egyptian military, their state media, began broadcasting over the radio airwaves all kinds of false reports saying they were the ones pushing Israel into the sea and they were making major advances on all fronts against the Israeli forces. Well, that fake news didn't only confuse the Egyptian forces on the ground who thought, hey, it's okay if we retreat here because we're advancing everywhere else, but it also lit the match that triggered the other Arab nations' involvement. Jordan advanced, so did Syria, eventually. And that fighting turned on the next phase of Israel's battle plan. There were a few significant fights and skirmishes, but on the whole, without Egyptian air power, Israel owned the skies and the ground as it advanced into places like Gaza, into the Sinai, and then also into the West Bank. Remember, prior to 1967, Jordan ruled over the West Bank and Egypt over Gaza. After this war, those would become areas known as the occupied territories. There were, there were territories, they were territories that Israel came to occupy and dominate after 1967, thanks specifically to this war. But then also in the north against Syria in the Golan region. Syria was also broadcasting fake news about defeating the Israeli army. But as Israel approached towns and settlements on the Syrian battlefront, they found them abandoned. Israel could have, if they wanted to, they could have advanced all the way to Damascus during this fighting. The only thing that really stopped them here was the threat that the Soviets were going to enter into the fighting on the side of their allies in Syria if Israel didn't halt. And in fact, that was really what brought the, the war to a close by day six, intervention from the great powers. By the end of the Six Days War in 1967, the map of Israel had been completely reshaped. From Egypt, Israel took the Gaza Strip and Sinai. From Syria, the Golan Heights. From Jordan, the West Bank, and most significantly, full control of the city of Jerusalem. The accounts of Israeli soldiers who fought to take Jerusalem during those six days of war, they're really pretty incredible. Many felt they were truly involved in some sort of higher cause, driven by mystical and invisible powers to take back the holy city from the Arabs and the Muslims. Some kind of power seemed to be working on their behalf to repel the Arabs. One general wrote about how he realized this was probably the most significant thing he had ever been a part of in his whole life. 
rabbis enlisted in the military walked into Jerusalem after it was taken, and they believed that the Messianic age would be ushered in at that point. And now, of course, it wasn't. And it wasn't wasn't ushered in after 1948 when other uh, Christian Zionists and people like that believed it would happen then. And that's the problem with these religious perspectives of modern Israel. The second part of the story never plays out as planned, and that was the same in Jerusalem. Rabbis called for the Palestinian Arabs who lived there in that city for generations to be expelled. Interestingly, Moshe Dayan, he put a stop to that. Instead, he called for the Israelis to behave humanely. It was really important for him to preserve the Israeli image during this war. The vision of humane treatment, it really couldn't hold up, though. That's just the way war works. By the end of the war, 300,000 Palestinians were exiled from their homes. At least 130,000 of these people, they had already endured being expelled a first time in 1948, only to live through it again less than 20 years later. One year later, at least 17 Israeli settlements were built on the rubble of these former Palestinian homes. The establishment of settlements meant it would be harder for the Palestinians to ever return to their homes, and this became a new policy initiative of some Israeli hardliners all the way to the present. But just as problematic as the expulsion and the settlements Israel Israel was now a legitimate occupying power in the West Bank and Gaza. They had whole populations, not Jewish populations, whole Palestinian Arab populations that they had to rule over, and they had to figure out how to do that. And it would never work. And we can see the proof of that all the way up to the present. But even beyond Israel, the geopolitical map of the Middle East was now reshaped. The Palestinians paid a huge price, of course, but so did the Arab states. And that went beyond land. Nasser was humiliated. His international reputation would would never recover, really, after 67. He offered his resignation to the Egyptian people, but millions of Egyptians took to the streets begging him to remain in power. In the coming years, one of his closest friends would actually attempt a coup against him. Three years later, he died, three years after the war, and Egyptian influence and leadership in the region really began to die with him after that. We'll discuss in the next episode, Jordan had a new kind of headache in the form of the Palestinians, uh, a lot of those who had fled. And these Palestinians included terrorist organizations that began to launch out from Jordan and into Israel. King Hussein endured this, but the next decade would be one of incredible instability in his nation. In Syria, Yet another coup toppled the leadership there that followed the Six Days War. And at that time, it was an Air Force commander, a guy by the name of Hafiz al-Assad. He came to power. Now, Assad would end the coups in Syria, but he and then his son would rule ruthlessly over the Syrian people all the way to the present. In other parts of the Middle East, like Iraq, hardliners came to power. Israel was now a legit threat in the region, and Arab leaders feared for what Israel might decide to do next. They seemed unstoppable. Not that the Arab leaders stopped their big talk after 1967. They always talked, but their talk was proven somewhat impotent after the Six Days War. And of course, the biggest change to the region as a whole in 1967 came with the U.S. The U.S. fell in love with Israel after 1967. To this day, Popular opinion among many Americans, including military and political leaders, has been shaped by what happened in the 1967 Six Days War. They see a warrior country. You'll hear phrases tossed about about Israel having the best military intelligence and fighting spirit in the world. Unspoken, but now a fact after 1967, is that all of this fighting spirit and military intelligence became subsidized by the U.S., Israel became a principal pillar of U.S. policy and strategy in the Middle East after 67. The news flashes clarified the situation. It soon became apparent that the Middle East power patterns of a decade were being changed in a matter of hours. Military analysts called it a lightning war. Although the fighting would continue for six days, the verdict of the battlefield had been rendered during the opening round. The road to a permanent peace in the Middle East would be a long one. Far more issues were raised by the fighting than were settled. To coordinate Abba Iban, the, the famous foreign minister of Israel during the 60, Six Days War, 
He said that the one thing that the Six Days War guaranteed was that there would be another war. Now, we're going to talk about that in the next episode here. As for now, this is how 1967 was a pivotal year that shaped and made the modern Middle East that we know today. Now, if you haven't been to the website yet, theendofhistory.net, please go there, sign up for the newsletter, find other resources and articles that will be of interest to you if you're enjoying this podcast series. We will be back uh, next week with our next episode, 1979. podcasts. Join us online at theendofhistory.net for articles and essays from the end of history. Follow JB on Twitter at JB underscore The End of History is produced by Windmill Media.